um, this is going to be the format. We are uh, going to talk a little bit about Arnet, just so that you know who we are and, and why the heck we are uh, playing in this space. And um, we're going to remind you about the sensitive data challenge and particularly the uh, specific pieces that Arnet is looking to solve. And we'll then move on to give an introduction to our project and there'll be a demo of what we've done so far. And we'll finish them up with the um, roadmap so that you actually know when you might be able to uh, get using this service. So uh, that's moving on to the first bit, which is the Arnet background. So the vision that Arnet has is that of a globally networked data sharing ecosystem. And that ecosystem should uh, accelerate knowledge creation and innovation. And we are actually a not-for-profit and we are owned by all of these good universities in Australia and CSIRO. So we are essentially owned by the uh, higher education and research sector. And we are most famous, I think, for our super fast network that actually connects up all the universities with each other, um, enabling data transfers and so on, and internet access and things like that. And that, uh, that, that network actually connects uh, Australia up with other national research and education networks around the world, and so enables global connectivity. Um, entities that we provide services to are actually not restricted just to universities, though. So we connect up schools, uh, TAFEs, cultural organization, publicly funded research organization and health bodies and so on. And uh, we also provide services that sit on top of that network and add value to it. Uh, Zoom is a very obvious one to, to highlight in this uh, COVID era. I think we're all very familiar with that, as you were saying earlier, Nicola. Um, another service that I do wanna uh, focus on for a little bit, and they are, um, good reasons why, is CloudStore. And CloudStore was developed through our collaboration with CERN. And CERN is the um, European Organization for Nuclear Research. And it's uh, one of the world's largest and, you know, it's, it's pretty respected uh, center for scientific research. And uh, essentially CloudStore, I think a few of you will be um, quite familiar with it, but it uh, enables collaborative file storage and sharing and it's got that sync and share capability. So some, some people tend to use it as a backup, for example, um, but it's richer than that. Um, it can actually share files in an encrypted manner. So within uh, CloudStore, as you can see there, there's this file sender capability. Um, you can actually put a time box on uh, access of files shared by a file sender and you can get some stats on the, uh, the file transfers if that's useful to you. Um, you can also use vouchers over here, uh, which actually enables you to give others the ability to share files via this secure mechanism, even if they don't have a, a cloud store account themselves. Um, you can also do data analysis directly within Cloud Store, and that's through our Jupyter Labs integration, which is delivered uh, by what we call SWAN. So our SWAN service, which is, and luckily it's written down because I always garble this, but service for web-based analysis. Um, and again, that's something that came about through that collaboration with CERN. Um, you can also, uh, within your browser window, also uh, collaboratively edit uh, files such as Word documents, PowerPoint slides, Excel spreadsheets, uh, in much the same way that you can with sort of Google Docs or Office 365. We also um, have a range of plugins that again enable you to do things with data without uh, the hassle of having to download to view it. So this one that I've got up here, uh, is actually a DICOM image and we have a DICOM viewer embedded in Cloud Store that enables you to, to view DICOM images. This one is actually a, a COVID patient, the thorax of a COVID patient. Um, and we also have a protein viewer, a PDF viewer, an audio file viewer, um, and so on, all directly within Cloud Store. So you can kind of start to see that it's very much a research focused application. Um, so you kind of might be wondering why I've spent some time talking to you about Cloud Store and it is relevant, so bear with me. Uh, but I just want to touch on our strategic direction at RNET. And these are our strategic priorities. But the ones that I want to actually call out are the, uh, the pillar around investing in health and medical research infrastructure the one around establishing a national collaborative research platform. And the last one is develop cybersecurity capability services and infrastructure. 
Um, and as you can imagine, sensitive data sits across all three of these strategic priorities on it. Um, so when we were approached by an increasing number of current cloud store users and enterprise university users, um, you know, asking us if they could put sensitive data on our cloud store service, um, you know, they, they were telling us that they couldn't collaborate on and manage their sensitive data. So we actually decided to look into this and see if there was anything that, that you know, could be done about it. Um, so I'll now move on to the sensitive data challenge and I appreciate that this forum is certainly not unaware of this. Um, but uh, first of all, just so we're on the same page, uh, the way that we define sensitive data, and I actually think that this definition uh, came about from uh, those involved in the formation of this community when it first came up at that eResearch Australasia conference BOF many years ago. Um, but sensitive data is data relating to people, animal or plant species. It's data generated or used under restricted commercial or government research funding agreement. And it's any data likely to have any significant negative uh, public or uh, personal impact if it's released, lost or modified. So it's a pretty broad definition. Um, and as, as you all know in this community, um, there's this gradient of, of sensitivity. So it could range from fully open data at one end to fully restrictive data at the other, where we've got human identifiable data. Um, and you could even add defense research data, you know, at the far right of that spectrum. Uh, but one challenge uh, is that there are different perceptions along this gradient. So someone may believe that the location of an endangered species, uh, the eggs, for example, is far more sensitive than uh, de-identified human data um, and some could view that their research data is more sensitive than that of a commercial entity and so on. So when you combine this with the aspects around ethics and, and privacy, it's really not a black and white space and it makes for a really challenging space. But um, as, as I said, I think I'm preaching to the choir. Um, but I just wanted to highlight the specific problem space that Arnet is looking to address because we're an infrastructure company. So, you know, addressing the uh, challenges around the ethics is definitely not, not one for us to start weighing into. Um, but we are looking uh, around this, this piece here. So researchers and their institutions are struggling to find or provide appropriate services that enable the storage management analysis and controlled collaboration of sensitive data. So, um, you know, it's a broad statement, but uh, different institutions are dealing with this differently. Uh, but in many cases, you know, universities are struggling to provide a service, be it because of uh, cost or, you know, the, the requirement to support it or legislative requirements around it. Um, and that leaves researchers using insecure methods such as, you know, maybe email or sharing hard drives and so on. And it also leaves institutions pretty blind about where their researchers' sensitive data assets lie and, and what the risk around those are. Um, and so this, you know, this, this problem uh, leaves the potential for massive reputational damage should, it, should something actually go wrong. So for example, if you, you know, leave your laptop on a train. Um, so what is Arnet doing about it? Well, we are using Cloud Store as a base model platform from which to build this. Um, given all those popular research focused capabilities that I spoke on uh, at the beginning, um, given that we already have those in existence, we are going to be using those uh, and build them out in a sensitive data capability. And that capability will be designed to support the sensitive data lifecycle uh, for, you know, our member universities, uh, health and medical institutions, you know, other, other sensitive data research such as ecology and, and so on. Um, and how we are doing it is in a phased uh, project approach. So phase one actually began uh, last year when we uh, engaged with some external uh, consultants on a review of our current practices, particularly in the information management space. Um, we also carried out a massive uh, consultation effort across the sector where we uh, spoke to a huge number of uh, existing Arnet service users and other organizations that deal with, with sensitive data. And we've also actually subsequently had a separate uh, Medical Research Institute engagement that's also been informative in many areas. But um, during these engagements, we gathered understanding about the pain points that people were struggling with 
and uh, that enabled us to get a really good view as to the requirements for a solution. Um, we uh, are now in phase two of the project, which is seeing us mature our information and information security management practices in line with ISO 27001 and 2. Um, ISO is a standard under the uh, International Organization for Standardization, which is a lot of standards, I, I know, but uh, it's one of the uh, standards that is uh, widely recognized as being uh, helpful when dealing with um, data of a sensitive nature. And so we are uh, working towards that. And then the uh, proof of concept is the other piece during phase two and the one that personally I find a lot more interesting. Um, but it's the one that we are going to focus on uh, today. Um, so I will skip some bits there. Um, but this is what we're aiming to build in the proof of concept. So if you look at step one, we have an admin uh, that creates an authorized user in the service. And that researcher can then log on to the platform using multi-factor authentication. And this gives them access to the platform that provides data analysis tools. So things like SWAN that I mentioned before and access to a uh, storage media option. So that's something new that we'd be bringing in here. So you could have something on disk uh, for data that you need regular access and, and performance around and you could shunt it onto tape for cold storage or archive and all of the data on the platform is encrypted. Um, the institution also has visibility of this, which, uh, which gives them, um, you know, that view of their sensitive data holdings. Um, now, it's important to note that that doesn't necessarily mean they have visibility of sensitive content. Um, but now, when a uh, researcher indicates, uh, you know, a requirement to share or collaborate on the data, they can actually use the platform to initiate an approval uh, process that happens at the institution. And so that request is assessed uh, by an individual or even a series of individuals, uh, if needs be, who are appointed to this authorizer role. And that authorizer can view uh, audit trails relating to the data and see who the requested collaborators are um, and then you know, make a decision whether to approve or reject that request. Um, if it's approved, then that new researcher gets uh, given access to the platform, which they in turn um, access uh, via multi-factor authentication and so on. So that is what we are aiming to uh, provide the sector with. And we are doing this through a proof of concept project, as I mentioned, and we are blessed uh, by being guided in this endeavor by our POC participants. So these uh, participants are incredibly knowledgeable and expert, uh, an expert group of people who, um, from, from these institutions here, um, and they encompass different roles within the institutions. So some are IT managers, others are clinical trial coordinators, researchers. Um, I think we've got some data curators in there and, and research data management specialists and so on. And all of them have been uh, incredibly generous with their time in helping us actually, you know, make sure that we have a valuable insight uh, as to what is needed for this service and make sure it's fit for purpose for all of those roles within an organization. So I will uh, hand over to Rob now, uh, my colleague, he is our sensitive data software developer, and he is going to take you through a, uh, a demo of what we've done so far. So Rob, do you need me to stop sharing now? Yeah, thanks, Frankie. If you could, I'll, um, I'll actually share a video that we've been preparing for the e-research conference next week, and that explains and runs through a lot of the features uh, of the system. So I'll share and play that now. Hi, my name is Rob and I'm going to show you the sensitive data Rob, class. Rob, I'll just system. interrupt you because we can't actually see your screen yet. We can hear the sound, but not your screen. All right. One second. I'll reshare it. So just while Rob is, is doing that tech shenanigans, 
Um, the Eve Research Australasia Conference, I'm pretty sure you're all aware, but that's next week. And uh, in this COVID time, we, we all had to present or provide our presentations pre-recorded. So uh, Rob put in some effort doing that and it, we, we figure it's uh, useful to be able to share it with you guys now. So we still don't have a visual. But we are maybe getting there. Uh, we can see we can see stuff now. But yes, yes, success. Right, cool, here we go. Hi, my name is Rob and I'm gonna show you the sensitive data cloud storage service that we're building at Arnet. We are developing this proof of concept in the cloud services team at Arnet using an agile software process. We are collaborating with a variety of external stakeholders from different institutions who have been great at giving us feedback to help guide and refine the product so that it will meet their needs. Security is an important part of managing sensitive data, so all data will be stored on dedicated hardware within Australia, with all data encrypted and backed up. All activities, including user logins and all file activity, will be logged and able to be exported from the sensitive data service. This service is designed to run within a web browser. This is a version of Chrome running full screen. And as you can see, there's only one action we can take here. So let's log in and I'll show you what happens next. So on this screen, you have to choose your institution from the list. For the purpose of this demo, I'll choose the Cloud Store Dev IDP. So here I have to type in my account, username and password. So because this is the first time I've logged in on this account, I'll have to set up my account for multi-factor authentication with a device. So I'll click on Start Setup. And you can see it's asking me to choose either a mobile phone or a tablet to bind to. So I'll choose mobile phone. And on this screen, you can enter a phone number anywhere in the world, and it will do a validation via SMS, and then that will be configured to uh, either send a push notification or to send an SMS pin code that you'll have to validate every time you log into the system. So after you've completed the initial setup, then you can continue the login and either send a push to your device or send a pin passcode. I'll choose to send a push and you should see this message pop up on the device. And when you choose approve, it will continue. So this is the home screen on the sensitive data service. As you can see, uh, there's not much you can do yet. You need to be able to create a new project. So we'll talk more about roles in the system shortly but only certain people can create new projects. In this case, the user I'm logged in with can, so let's go ahead and make one now. So there may be a lot more options you can choose to customize your project in the future, but this is all we have at the moment. As you can see, the project appears as a folder on your screen. If we click on the project, then we go into that folder. And from here, we can start uploading and adding files that we want to share with people or collaborate on. So there are a few different ways to upload files into the project. If you click on the plus new, you can choose to upload a file or a folder here, create a new folder or edit a new file directly. I'm going to go ahead and drag my files into this area, which will upload them automatically. So now you can see the files have been uploaded and depending on what type of file they are, they'll either be an icon or a preview on the left hand side of the file name. And over here on the right, you can see some actions on the file. You've got rename, download or delete to remove the file from the service.
So now if we go back to the home screen, if we want to look at the properties of the example project we've made, we click there and we can see we can either add users or view collaboration requests. I'll come back to that later for now. I just want to add another user to the project. So you can type in the user's name or email address. And here we've got roles. So we can choose a couple of different roles for this person. We've got the authorizer who can uh, add users directly or uh, approve or reject collaboration requests. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, then we've got collaborators who can access or change the project files. And lastly, we've got people that can only view the files and that includes uh, accessing them, downloading and previewing the files. So I'll make test on user five a collaborator and add them to the project. So jumping ahead and logging in as test user five, you can see I've got access to the example project. If I click on the project properties, you can see I don't have access to add users directly, but I can create a collaborator request. So I'll go and do that now. So let's say I want to add test user four to the project. And I can choose what role they can have. They can't be an authorizer because I'm not an authorizer myself. They can be a collaborator, which is the same as me, or they can be a viewer. So I'll choose that one. So optionally, you can enter a reason why they should get access. And you can specify an authorizer who you want to approve this. Okay, now I'll send the request and I'll go back to uh, the admin five users screen and show you what they see. So back at the admin five users screen, if I click on the project properties and go to view requests, you can see here there's the request that we created for test user four to become the viewer in this project. Uh, it was requested by uh, test user five and requested to me who is admin five and you can see here there is a reason with a little eye icon you can click this and then see a pop-up showing the reason that they've requested this for so from here you can do two things you can go across the right hand side and choose approve which will grant them access or reject which will uh, get rid of the collaboration request and not approve them i will approve them because i want to demo what that looks like Okay, that's now been done and then I'll jump across to that new user and show you what they see. So I've logged in as test user 4 who now has access to the project and if I click on the project properties you can see I am a viewer and if I click on the project folder you can see I have access to these files but under the actions I only have the ability to download the file not to rename or delete the file because I'm not a collaborator or an authorizer. So I can download the file now. In the future, we will have plugins to support common files uh, in this UI uh, to allow collaboration and editing in real time. And that wraps up the presentation for the Sensitive Data Service at Arnet. Thanks for listening. All right, that's the end of it. Um, I covered a lot of content. Do I have any questions on anything there? There was a heck of a lot of chat, actually, that I was desperately trying to keep on top of. Um, there might be some that I can call out that I didn't get to. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, Rob, we might have a bit more, um, uh, what do we call it? Space to see stuff. Um, so Fido2, Two, I believe uh, that was a question from Lance. That is uh, some kind of encryption. I am not the one to ask about that. Is Gavin on the line? He is. Gavin, yes. is that a question for you? Yes, he is. Uh, the 2FA method. So the. the... Uh, so the question was, let me get this right for you. Is there support for the FIDO2 industry standard? SMS two-factor is known to have some challenges. So actually, so I am unfamiliar with what FIDO2 yeah, does. Yeah, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that one as well. So can we note that one and uh, respond to it offline? Yep, yep. Um, 
yeah, sure we can. And what else have I missed? Uh, Mike, I appreciate the, your, your comment about how it'd be lovely to be able to, you know, create a user in your own systems and have that automatically carry through into uh, the sensitive data service. We have heard that before, um, and that is something that we have got on our backlog. Um, uh, other questions, Patrick, the multi-factor, you know, if we were to rely on multi-factor from another, uh, from, a, from a user's home institution, I guess that, that could be desirable from the researcher's perspective, but it does add a vulnerability to the system in that it is relying on the approaches or the security of approaches of a, another uh, institution. And so that's, yeah, we're perhaps not so keen on that one. Yeah, it was considered. Um, yeah. Um, does the upload process place them into a holding space that the project owner can approve for them to be available in the project? So not at this time. So the approval workflows that we have are around individuals. So once that principal authorizer or, or project uh, owner has actually uh, allowed a researcher into that project space, they can kind of do whatever they want. Um, at this time to add so to that, we have had that brought up a few times so it is something we will definitely look at um, i think that's quite possible that we'll have that feature for upload but not for download so you have to consider um being sensitive data based you want to be careful about who has access to the system that doesn't go through that 2fa process because that is an audit trail as well but it's less it's considered less significant uploading stuff into it than downloading, but you could debate that as well. Thanks, Rob. Um, we've got another question from Mike here, which Gavin might be one to um, back to you. Uh, Mike has asked about Cloud Store's reporting um, in that, uh, can we see versioning information across all storage contents rather than having to click for the properties on every single file? So that's current Cloud Store. Is the Arnet uh, sensitive data service going to improve on that? So is that like a, a summary report on, on file versions? Uh, well, yeah. uh, anything at all, really, um, because when we've got hundreds of thousands of files um, mm -hmm. and we don't know if we've got um, if like multiple versions of files, right. so okay. the so only way we can find out is to click on every single one of them, which will basically yeah. Yeah. take years. Um, Rob, have you seen any variation on that in the new version of, of own cloud? Because it's, it's an own cloud limitation, obviously, uh, and Rob's been working quite closely with the new version. No, not yet. So I'm curious to know what the intent is behind providing that information. What are you planning to use it for? Um, this is something um, you say, um, like when we've been working with um, media flux as well, so that we can actually um, identify when uploads have been made to the same document or files by different people and to know that we can retrieve older ones. Um, we've basically got no um, view into the system that lets us know if that is, uh, if the, the right stuff is there so that, and you know, even if we could, if we could get a report or if we could, you know, pr programmatically retrieve all files before a certain time, because we might know that everything after a certain date was corrupt or something like that. Um, so there's a lot of scenarios where this, this comes up where in other recovery and repository situations. I mean, Arnett does have a process for recovering data. Um, in the past, if that's what you're talking about. No, this this is yeah, this is more version version level. Um, uh, uh, then, um, uh, the closest I'd say that we have is um, full audit logging. So anytime yeah. a file is changed in the system, and anytime anyone logs in or logs out, there will be an audit trail that, if you're an authorizer, you'll have access to. So you can definitely see that information. But if you want to do kind of a bulk restore on files or on the project, that's not something that's currently available. But, but also to note that we're, uh, particularly with this service that we're making, we're working towards making that activity log um, uh, more accessible because currently, you know, you won't, only individuals see their activity logs. Um, so we're, we're trying to, you know, make it that, and 
uh, authorizer can see the audit log for a project and local admins can, can see audit logs um, and that they're accessible in a download or API format, which they're currently not in Cloudstore. Yeah. We, we know that. Because so also in, in terms of access log, if, if you're using the rocket uploader, then there's kind of a, a, a latency issue in terms of timing, which means that the logs that we see already aren't terribly helpful in terms of timing because the upload time and the time that it appears in cloud store can be hours or days apart so like actually having some other um, tabled information in reports that we can use rather than looking at a single linear activity log would be really helpful so we'll let's let's note that one as a as a feature request sure and mike you had another question on our <laughs> list uh, can we get IP location information to prevent access from outside Australia or known public VPNs? Is that something that, yeah. Does anybody in the Arnet team have an answer to that one? I'm definitely not the tech guru. Yeah, that, that's for where we have clinical information that is not to be um, downloaded or viewed by anyone from outside Australia. Um, yes, so. I mean, I, I guess in some ways, Mike, the way that we're thinking of, of you know that the users of the system would respond to that is simply not give people access to it but are you thinking of the situation where you've got a you know a, a australian researcher that happens to go off on holiday overseas god forbid when that might be but and then tries to you know sort of access their data overseas is that the situation well that's that's a very real thing it's like people who go to conferences on sabbaticals we have um, external collaborators where we don't aren't aware of their movements at all we expect with our governance for these things is that the chief investigator should be on top of this and reporting it back to our governance committee so that we can mm. make appropriate changes but other our other systems allow us to do basically IP filtering and so on to to stop that kind of access but um, again it's cloud store is kind of e extra to our organization's ability to to view gate control all of that kind of stuff yeah yes no understood and I think that's another one that we will um, will will add to the you know the backlog um, I'll move on to a question from Patrick, which has just shifted out of my view. Um, Patrick says, where, where does the source of collaborators come from? And I guess the answer to that is anywhere and anything. And that links to a question from Martin that says, can international investigators be added as collaborators? Um, absolutely, we need to be able to enable that. We are having that feedback from our POC participants um, quite regularly. Uh, the way that we're considering that at the moment, though, is to leave it to the institution to add uh, those individuals to their, you know, to create a, an account uh, for those individuals. Um, I guess the uh, risk of us doing it for them, which is possible, is that we don't necessarily know if that, you know, a collaborator is no longer uh, should no longer be able to access the space, um, whereas the institution will know. And there could be, you know, by, by being using us as a step removed, it, it increases the chances of, you know, um, inappropriate access being available when the university wants to shut it off immediately. So uh, that is the answer to uh, that one. Am I missing anything else? So yes, Kristen, what what are the platform's predefined roles and how are the POC institutions looking to implement them? Uh, so in terms of the platform's predefined roles, we have a tenant admin that will be a sort of IT focused role at the institution that will be able to create the project spaces. And we then have a principal authorizer that essentially in many, in many instances will be, you know, the PI or the professor or who, um, who runs a research group. We will have collaborators uh, that sit within that, uh, or researchers that sit within that project space, and then collaborators uh, that will join the, the project space, and then external collaborators that may have access to uh, upload into the project space, but maybe not accessing the project space altogether. And then there's an Arnet uh, sort of IT uh, role in the mix as well. So those are those sorts of, 
uh, roles. And I guess the question about how the POC institutions are looking to implement them, Christian, is uh, perhaps uh, not best aimed at me. We do have a few of them on the line, but I certainly do not want to put them in the spotlight about what they're thinking about in this space. Um, and have HREX, HREX, help me out, Kristen. I'm, my acronym soup is failing me right now. Higher Ethics research. Committees. Ah, ethics committees, of course. Um, not directly. So via our participants would be the answer to that one. Okay. Uh, Stephen, do you seed the initial service for an institution? Do you seed? Uh, this is having one admin that can create projects and assign owners to the project. I think I answered that one. Yes. So we have a tenant admin that creates the project space and assigns that principal uh, authorizer or, or project owner to, to it. So yes. Uh, at, so Patrick, the service relies on authentication at a user's home institution. So how is that different to relying on 2MFA? Good point. And I will uh request my far more savvy colleagues to answer that one if possible that's already sort of been answered earlier in the chat oh, i hadn't okay. realized i hadn't realized okay good all right good because i was i was floundering on that one um and then mike you've written we're writing governance docs that state the ci must sponsor external collaborators without aaf access to get internal perfect so that is it. sorry and i've finished that sentence um Sorry, I was re thinking ahead of my reading. We are writing governance docs that state the CI must sponsor external collaborators without AAF access to get internal institutional logins. That is exactly the mechanism we anticipate enabling external collaborators having access. Uh, Stephen, can you have a viewer but with no download capability? Yes, I believe we can. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting one. We've brought this up. Um, within Arnet, and I guess the challenge there is if you're viewing it in a browser, essentially the browser is downloading it. So you could argue you could then persist the data. We could disable the download option, uh, definitely. That is something um, to consider. But if, if you're allowing someone to read it, they could always screenshot it or do things like that. So it depends on exactly what you want to prevent there, but you can look at blocking the download feature. All right, and I think we made it to the end of the chat. So I will continue uh, in the interest of time. Am I Sorry, sharing? Frankie. Oh yeah, go. Um, just in response to Mike's stuff. Um, so you're talking about having to get institutional logins. Is AF virtual home still okay? Uh, so we're, we're ba yeah, so we're basically pushing like our systems, they're going through, for, say for CloudStorm or RedCap, they're going through AAF. Um, and so everyone who has got an institutional account is going through AAF anyway. Um, so if you've got someone at a external institution who is not a subscriber to AAF, then we're basically saying that you need to sponsor them for, in our case, a Macquarie login account. Um, and then we will have a regular kind of audit process where we will actually check the bona fides of external people on a you know regular basis. The same applies if, like I could set up an external collaborator using, uh, say the QCIF a, a virtual home. Um, someone vets that, that that's a valid person and it's the correct email address and we can create them with an AAF identity. It's just they don't have, say, a UQ login or a Griffith login. They've just got a, an AAF one that we create for them. Um, I'm not familiar with um, that capacity, but the reality is that for a lot of our external collaborators is that they may need to be accessing multiple systems or storage within the university and that we may as well just bring them in so that they can access everything under one umbrella account because otherwise if we've got to manage one person under multiple external identities it, it gets a bit tricky yeah <laughs> I mean, just it, so some, some Stephen, Stephen and Mike I, I might um ask yeah, you to, to take that sure. one yeah sorry um we've got a few minutes left and there's a still a couple of bits that I was uh hoping to share so um, but yes, I appreciate that the um, authentication piece is one that is uh, forever interesting and there's lots of permutations that need to be sorted out. 
Um, but uh, just to get us back uh, on track and just to summarize the service, because the demo showed some aspects, but not all. But these are the key service features that we uh, anticipate in a final service. So um, we've got uh, controlled and auditable collaboration. So those audit logs will see, uh, will show what's, you know, what's been done with what and who's done it and when and who approved it and so on. Um, the next four on the list there about collaborative editing, data analysis, plugins and, and secure file transfers, I touched on earlier when I talked about our current capability, so I won't actually go into those now. Um, we do also have data management capabilities, which I didn't uh, touch on earlier, but our collections plugin uh, enables people to package up data alongside a, a metadata wrapper, if you will. And we're looking to strengthen this and, and even automate some metadata extraction. Uh, but the data on the platform will obviously be backed up. Um, and I also mentioned that there'd be an ability to shunt the data off onto cold storage when, you know, when the time is right. And we all know on this call that there are often retention uh, requirements around data. So for example, you know, that 25 years for clinical trial data and, and that this uh, slower data storage option, uh, which comes at a much cheaper cost might be uh, useful to run there. Uh, and the aim uh, for the service is that it will be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, uh, with the exception, she adds, of maintenance outages, but those will be uh, notified through our status dashboard, which will tell you about any hazards, alerts, and, and maintenance notifications. Um, and this being a sensitive data service, I also thought to highlight the security features of the service uh, specifically. So users will only be able to use the service through multi-factor authentication. Um, so that will give confidence that the users are who they say they are. And I've already talked about uh, collaboration workflows, uh, audit logs, and even ISO certification. So the next uh, piece that I'll focus on is dedicated hardware. Um, all of the infrastructure will be on its own private network and isolated from the rest of our net and the internet and it'll be in high security tier three data centers that are either ISO 27001 or ASIO T4 certified. And please don't ask me what ASIO T4 uh, certification <coughs> entails. Um, but all the uh, data on that infrastructure um, will be stored on Arnet owned and operated hardware hosted within Australia. So we do not host Australian research data or metadata outside of Australia. Um, we talked briefly on encryption because I got it confused, uh, but all the disk data will be encrypted at rest uh, with uh, each disk encrypted with its own unique key and data is transmitted over secured, uh, secured channels, so encrypted and uh, on authenticated connections. And the service will be operated across, uh, at this stage anyway, two geographically distributed sites within Australia. Um, but we have the potential to expand this as the service grows. Um, and those sites will be connected to each other by a dedicated 100 gigabits per second or, or faster private network on the Rnet4 network. And so that enables the data to be replicated across those sites. So that is uh, the security features on the, uh, gosh, I'm seeing a lot of chat. I cannot keep up, sorry. Uh, I'll just finish and we can touch on it at the end, hopefully. But this is the uh, sensitive data roadmap where we're at now. So we are soon moving into our pilot stage, which is going to see a limited number of institutions take on the service and actually adopt it for their sensitive data purposes. So if you have any interest in that at all, uh, please contact me. You can email me at that address. And following a successful pilot, we'll be moving to make this available as a service to all institutions that have some sensitive data care uh, in Australia sometime in 2021. And I definitely uh, do not want to miss thanking those that are making this possible. So on the left, we have uh, all alphabetical, you'll note. Um, we have the list of POC participants, uh, the experts from our collaborating institutions. And on the right, uh, we have our Arnet uh, gurus that are uh, helping to uh, develop this. And Rob's been leading that, that charge from a development perspective. Uh, I won't go through the names, but without them, we wouldn't actually be able to uh, be where we are today. So I think, yes, that's the last one. So are there any questions? And do I need to go through the chat? Can somebody help me catch up on the chat, perhaps? Yes, there's a question about the cost model from Mike Williams. 
uh, in development would be the answer to that, Mike. We're working on it. So Arnett, uh, but I'll just, I will add that Arnett's not for profit. So, you know, essentially whatever it costs us is, is pretty much what, what you guys receive. Uh, we're not out to uh, rape and pillage the higher education community. Uh, did I miss anything else, Rob? Yeah, Stephen Bird asked about other data analysis options, so plugins for Nectar or HPC. Ah, or connections to a good question. And Gavin, off mute. <laughs> Sorry, momentarily distracted. What was okay, the question? Okay, let, let me answer it then. Uh, so Stephen was asking about other data analysis options such as Nectar and HPC. And I guess one thing I can mention is that we are looking, uh, well, we have a, oh no, is that confusing things? So we have a cloud store node at uh, NCI, but our sensitive data service is going to be quite a separate beast. Um, yes, but we are currently, also, currently they would be. Yes, we are also looking about potential linkages to palsy, and that might be an easier, uh, easier one to tackle at this time. But Gavin, I might leave that to you to... Yeah, um, and also there's, there's like, you know, we're looking at what we can do with cloud store first. So. Um, uh, because then obviously we have to seriously consider the security model for transposing that to sensitive data. Uh, for Cloud Store, as Frankie said, um, uh, we're still working on the in interconnects for NCI and Pawsey, um, as well as we're very interested in a model of being able to deploy SWAN itself out into either the Nectar Cloud or into HPC. Um, so apart, apart from that, the, the um, so you can mount a cloud store co co collection onto a Nectar VM. I'm presuming that script wouldn't connect to this service at this point in time. Not at not at this point in time. No, um, because it, effectively, like you know, um, I guess it, it's it's equivalent to being able to download into an unsecure environment. So. Sure. Um, while you're off mute, Gavin, there was a question from Stephen Bird on limits on data sizes. I'm not sure if there's a specific limit we impose. There is not a specific limit that we impose. It'll come down to the uh, pricing model and 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 what the um, institutions would be able to purchase. Sorry. Do you mean, Stephen, data sizes as in uploading and, and downloading or, or just sort of allocations of project spaces? Actually, both, uh, Frankie, in terms of, you know, if, if I've got a four gig file, am I hitting HTTPS limits in terms of the, up, the upload? Um, or do I need to bring it in in a different mechanism? But also, you know, if, I, if I've got hundreds of terabytes of sensitive data, is that an issue? If you have purchased hundreds of terabytes of worth of project game. space, um, <laughs> then, then, then absolutely. Um, uh, right. Mike, <clears throat> Michael, what's what's our sort of HTTPS limits for file size at the moment? Oh, we could easily do a gig. Yeah, I'm just thinking some of the you know, medical imaging and stuff like that. that, that <clears throat> um, well, that, that's that. that's you know that's browser based um, uh, drag and drop. So yeah. obviously, um, uh, you'll be able to use um, uh, sync clients and um, tools like our client for upload as well to overcome those limitations. Okay, thanks. And Mike, I've spotted your question about voice transcription services, the interest that you've got in that. Um, <laughs> no, uh, that, that, that will not be offered by the Arnet Zoom service in, um, uh, and um, it's very uh, uh, difficult for Arnet to, to keep up with, with the, the Zoom offering. So we are, I guess, um, encouraging those who want to access those services to, to look at moving to the um, uh, Zoom cloud as part of their, their Arnet subscription. Uh, so I'd refer you to the, the Zoom team to discuss that one. Yeah, we can't, yeah, it's just that all of their stuff's overseas. So they- Yeah, yeah. I, I understand that yeah, um, so, it's, yeah. uh, if, if it's if it's our yeah maybe maybe we'll add that one to the feature list um, but it's sort of opening the gates on on a whole bunch of zoom features that is um, very hard for a small team like us to keep up with yes so Gavin you mentioned you know the sort of reliance on zoom for that now Mike you might be somewhat comforted to know that 
as you've seen, we have a strategic priority to support the health and medical sector, whether that's through a Zoom service on voice transcription or something else is, you know, open to, to consideration, I guess, you know, as we sort of start to strengthen our infrastructure offerings in that health and medical space, maybe that is one if it's, uh, you know, one that is bugging and, and, and challenging and uh, inhibitory to everybody, maybe that's one that could be one of the things that we pick off the um, to do list. So um, I will wrap up there, I think. Uh, Katie, yes, I think uh, this, yes, I can make the slides available to Nicola, who will share them with the rest of the uh, community of practice. I think Nicola, best hand over to you with just a couple minutes remaining. Uh Awesome, thank you. Um, thank you so much. That was uh, what you can um, see from the chat. That was very useful. Um, so I just have a couple of uh, details to share. So um, for our, our next meeting will tentatively be on Wednesday the 11th of November. Um, it'll be one of our discipline specific uh, topics, um, probably health and medical. Um, but as soon as I have more details nailed down, I'll both share that in the mailing list and also update the website. Uh, excitingly, we also have um, a Birds of a Feather session coming up next week at eResearch Australasia. So if you'll be attending, then um, please join us there on Thursday. And uh, if you're not already a member of the mailing list, um, then please do join up. Uh, there's a form on our Google site. And apart from that, I think we are done. So I will be um, putting the slides and um, also uh, documenting the questions and answers uh, into the uh, communal document. And apart from that, thank you very much, everyone very much for your time. And um, I'll see you next time. Thanks, Nicola. See ya.